Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Sim Kern, pronouns they, them. I'm an author and a booktuber and today I'm celebrating because I just passed 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. exciting uh thank you all of you who have subscribed and have been interested in hearing me talk about writing and books and stuff like that um it's been uh really fun and to celebrate i asked people on twitter and instagram uh if they had any questions for me to do another q a sort of casual celebration and i've got about 15 questions here that i will be answering for you about all kinds of things ranging from just like being non-binary to writing to reading influences uh, to talking about space billionaires since you may remember my space billionaire rant earlier this year that went pretty viral so we had some follow-up questions about that let's get started before we do I want to shout out uh, Lisa Chow who you can find at Lisa Chow art um, on Instagram and Twitter and she uh, made this t-shirt and she makes lots of really cool art that you can buy lots of like very femme astronauts and Chinese princesses and she's working on a picture book about a time traveling girl with a dragon I can't wait for it to come out so Lisa's amazing go check out her art um, okay with that let's get into the questions I'm gonna grab my tea um, what made you want to YouTube it's a great question uh, for me I, I had wanted to be doing it for years because I love YouTube. I love watching YouTube. I just, it's just such a great way to relax. And I'm really bored of like all the TV that gets made, all the grim dark cop dramas and stuff that we have on offer. So um, I love BookTube. I love AuthorTube. I love ASMR. I love animatics. Um, just little random things that people make. So. I was a big fan of just YouTube in general and I decided to start it during the pandemic because um, sometimes I just have things I want to talk about you know ideas that I have that I could go ahead and like write an article and try to publish it in a magazine but the thing is whenever I'm writing something that's not like my book or an article I'm working on or sort of a a main thing I feel guilty that I'm not working on my book right so if I just want to like talk about my revisions process some authors do write that up and include that in a blog or a newsletter but to me I wanted an outlet that wasn't writing based so instead of a, like an author newsletter I have this channel where I can just get my ideas out there in a different kind of more casual format where I don't have to do so much writing and preparation. How do you make your picture book lists? So these are uh, in reference to my picture book haul videos, which I haven't done as many of lately because um, the thing is during the pandemic, the all our libraries closed in the city for a year and a half where we couldn't go in the library. So to get library books, you had to like go in and search titles and, and pull them up. And that's when I started doing like themed lists. Like I'd get 20 books about one topic or thing, just because that was easier for me than thinking about like trying to get a book from like 10 different topics. So uh, basically I just go to Google and search. Like I, I tended to do like seasonal things like this time of year, Thanksgiving. I did a picture book haul. I'll put the link in the description of um, 20 Native American books, picture books. And so a list that I used uh, was one from Colors of Us, which is a great blog that has lists of books, um, mostly focusing on like diver diversity in picture books. And they give reviews and stuff. So I just kind of go through those lists. First, I search for all the ones that interest me and then our library like doesn't have a lot of picture books. So then I'd end up getting the ones that like, one sounded interesting and two, seemed age age appropriate for my kid who was three at the time and three the library actually had them so uh that's kind of how i got my theme list and so i haven't done one lately because the library has been open so i've been taking my daughter to go and she just picks out random stuff um which <laughs> are not thematically related and are she doesn't always pick out like the best books so i need to just if i want to keep doing picture book list videos i just need to do it for myself really um and pick some themes and, and do the preparation to, to get the holds and get the books ahead of time. Um, all right, when did you know that you are non-binary and how did you figure it out? 
So I have a video that I'll put the link in the description, which is uh, Renfest Made Me Trans, which was a little bit of a tongue in cheek video, but it's a very long video explaining my whole gender journey. Uh, the, honestly though, the answer is like, I was, I always knew I was non-binary. I just didn't have a word for it. Like ever since I can remember, apparently I had a very girly phase when I was like three and four, which is before my brain kind of came online. Um, but one of my earliest memories is like begging to get my hair cut short. And that was when I was five years old. Uh, I pretty much like lived as a trans boy for much of my childhood. Um, I, you know, everywhere I went, people would, you know, call me, Hey, little man, what's up? Young boy, you know, <laughs> like strangers and shopkeepers and stuff. I mean, no one knew I was a girl. Um, and I loved it. So I, I always knew that I, my gender was different and I didn't put the name non-binary to it until I was in my thirties. And I was the first time I heard the term in my early thirties. Uh, I had a couple friends who came out as non-binary. So in order to support them and understand them, I started reading about it and learning to use their pronouns. And I talked to them about it. And I, my initial instinct was one of like jealousy and like, well, if I'd had that word when I was in my teens or twenties, then I could have come out as non-binary, but I'm too old now. I've been a woman too long and I can't do it. Uh, and that eventually, it took me a couple years to realize that that was bullshit and I'm still young and I can still live the rest of my life authentically. So pretty much as soon as I heard the term non-binary, I was like, boom, that's me. Now I know that's not the case for all non-binary people. I'm not saying you have to have known from the time you were born that your gender was different. Uh, at all, all our journeys and flavors and experiences are valid and you can self-identify however you want. So if it makes you happy to be non-binary, be non-binary. Uh, we don't get keep on this channel. Someone else asked, would love general advice on navigating a writing career as a non-binary person. Great question. Honestly, the good news is I think being a writer is one of the best industries to be non-binary. <laughs> Honestly, because it's not an industry to make money that you can live on. So in that way, it's kind of more low stakes. Like you don't have, you're not gonna make probably, I mean, vast, vast majority of us for a very, very long time of our career will not be making enough money to live off of. So that kind of gives you room to be more authentic and insist on your non-binary identity in publishing in a way that the job that you rely on your bread and butter for, it can be much more difficult to do. I think also publishing is at least on the surface levels, very eager right now to support trans people and non-binary people and it is very uh looked down upon to you know marginalize us or get our pronouns wrong or anything like that so that's not the case in most industries again so you're kind of in a good place just be yourself and insist on how you want to be treated because at the end of the day you're probably not going to make money anyways and most people are going to be cool with it. Uh, if anything, they'll need like a quick correction and then they're, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And if you do run into someone who's actually transphobic, the good news is I don't think you need them. Uh, I This happened to me early in my career. The first story, one of the first stories, I think it was the second story I ever sold to Canary Lit Mag. Um, the editor refused to print my pronouns and I tried to educate her and we went back and forth through several emails and she just refused to do it. She was like, they, them is incorrect. And so I pulled the story and I'm so glad I did that and ended up going, the story ended up going viral on Twitter. And then I, um, was asked to write about it for out magazine. So I didn't need that, that one transphobic puny little editor, like the writing community had my back. So. I don't think that you need uh, to, to deal with transphobes in the writing community and I don't think you should and just be yourself and insist on your identity and you should be good. Um, okay. Sorry. I was swiping the camera. I was getting some text messages during that thread. So, all right. Now we have a couple questions about the space billionaires, which uh, I'll, I guess I'll also link to some of my articles about space billionaires that I wrote this summer. Is the billionaire space race a threat to the climate? 
So first of all, the existence of billionaires is perhaps the greatest threat to cl the climate or is symbolic of the greatest threat to the climate, which is because billionaires, right? First of all, their lifestyles are incredibly consumptive, like many orders more than your average person on planet earth uh, because they leave these jet setting lifestyles. Their houses are enormous. Like their carbon footprint is huge. The carbon footprint of their ego driven space industries is also enormous, right? Rocket fuel, a lot of carbon. Uh, but also billionaires are the, the at the top of capitalism, right? Which is this world devouring system that we live in. And all of our society is prioritized around giving this tiny handful of people more and more and more and more wealth and power. That's what the whole world is going towards. And as long as our society is ordered in that way, as long as we exist under capitalism, where the profit motive, where helping rich people get richer is the number one priority of every, pretty much, government on earth with a handful of exceptions, uh, as long as we have that system, we're destined to self-destruct and to consume more of this planet than we restore until we all die. So yeah, the existence of billionaires themselves is a massive threat to the climate. Billionaires should not exist. We need to get rid of billionaires if we want to create a sustainable, habitable world for future generations. And the billionaire space race um, has an enormous footprint. And I think that it also, this idea that uh, Elon Musk is selling that we can escape Earth and live on some colony somewhere else, that we can just consume the earth and then move on to another planet which we will consume is co first of all completely false <laughs> we cannot we are not and that's what the articles i wrote this summer were about we are not anywhere near technologically capable of establishing a permanent colony anywhere in space any such colony would need enormous coordination and support from the earth and if the earth is crumbling and falling apart because of climate collapse you are not going to have that support and it, it, and even though this mythology that we can flee to space is completely false, a lot of people buy into it. A lot of people think that Elon Musk really is going to establish a colony on Mars for the rich or a space hotel for the rich where they can just exist and screw off the earth. And that kind of lulls is so wrong and it lulls people into a false sense of security that life after earth is possible it's absolutely not the earth is probably it for humanity and possibly for life in the solar system and as far as we know life in the universe so we need to really be treating our home and our only home as the incredibly precious and limited sacred place that it is and i think that the whole billionaire space race narrative is dangerous to that are space billionaires better or worse than nobody doing space at all? With public funding for robust space exploration at almost zero, because we are not willing to fund much of anything anymore, is it better to never send humanity out at all or have Musk do it? That's kind of a good question, but there's a premise in there that's false, which is public funding for robust space exploration at almost zero. Being the spouse of a NASA person is not almost zero. There's we still have enormous public space infrastructure. I mean, I live and my family lives thanks to, to NASA. Um, I think that anything space billionaires could do, the public sector could do better if it were properly funded. I think this is a false choice between space billionaires at all or public, um, publicly funded. You know, it's not all or nothing. Right now, it's, it's a mix. NASA has still a ton of infrastructure. Uh, but it is true that these public companies are the ones that are building most of the actual like vehicles and stuff that we are sending into space. We could easily change that if we had the political will to do so. And, and if, we could, if we could fund NASA in, to do these things that um, we're allowing private companies to do and profit off of. I personally though, if it was a choice between space billionaire led space exploration or nothing, I would choose nothing because I'm petty like that and I don't give a fuck if Bezos and Musk did get to take their joy rides. I mean, they're not doing science the way that NASA does. They're just purely promoting their own egos and basically building billion dollar carnival rides for the super rich and I would rather the super rich have to stay on the fucking ground like the rest of us. 
So yeah, if the choice actually came down to like space billionaires or nothing, I choose nothing because fuck them. Um, okay, and now I didn't like that question. I mean, thank you for asking it. It's a good question, but it like is not fun to talk about. But this is very fun to talk about, which is my favorite bird. And I thought a lot about this over the last few days. And I'm gonna have to go with the Eastern Screech Owl. We get them here in our trees, sometimes at night. And the first time I heard one, because they don't sound anything like owls, like what you think an owl sounds like. The first time I heard them, it sounds like, like a little alien with like a little device is in your yard, like a little cute, tiny blue alien. Um, because it goes like, and it just sounds wild. It sounds out of this world. And um, so I didn't know what it was the first time we started having them visit our oak tree back here. And we snuck outside one night and looked and we saw this tiny owl. I mean, they're so small. They're like this big. And uh, yeah, we, we get them once in a while and I love them so much every time they visit. It makes me so happy. So definitely, um, definitely like the Eastern Screech Owl a lot. Cedar Waxwing was a close second. Next question, favorite places to enjoy nature in Houston? So for inside the city limits, the Houston Arboretum is one of the prettiest places. I love just walking on the greenways along the bayou. Uh, we have some a little narrow strips of prairie growing along the bayou and it can be quite pretty and you can see uh, lots of cool birds and turtles sometimes along there. Um, the Arboretum is a little bit more, you know, they have some ponds and stuff and some forested areas right in downtown, which is nice to look at. It's nothing compared to like the Morton Arboretum in Chicago where I grew up, but um, it's what we've got here. <laughs> the prettiest place within like close driving distance of Houston is Brazos Bend, which is a gorgeous swamp area south of the city where you're guaranteed to see like 10 alligators every time you go. And if you're very lucky, you might see like a roseate spoonbill or a whooping crane. There's all kinds of really cool birds. You'll definitely see a bunch of galliules, which are really pretty like blue and purple and green little wading birds that wade in the, in the swamp. Like they'll wade like five inches from an alligator's nose and they'll be, you know, looking for little grubs under the water and stuff. Um, so yeah, love going down to Brazos Bend. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, okay. Are you going to Texas Ren Fair this year? Yes, I am. So yeah, we're taking all the kids. So this is gonna be a different experience. I've never taken my kids before. When I've gone before, it's been an adult affair and there's been a good deal of drinking and partying. Uh, we're not gonna be doing that this time. We're taking the kids. It's gonna be really expensive <laughs> and sober and maybe kind of miserable, but I think it'll be really fun to see the kids like enjoying it and you know, frolicking at the Ren Fest. Um, okay, what are your favorite festivals and holidays? So holidays are a bit of a double-edged sword for me because being the mom figure in this house, uh, I end up having to like do all, like pretty much all the work and planning and preparation for holidays. And sometimes it's a lot. And so sometimes I dread them. But then when I actually do them and everyone's together and eating good food and I end up really enjoying it. So, you know, kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, I do love Hanukkah. I love some fried food. I love the latkes. I love Sucanio with the little, I make little homemade jelly donuts. Uh, that is a lot of fun. There's the candles, there's the singing. The kids really like it. We play dreidel with the gelt. I mean, it's a good, there's a lot of good stuff about Hanukkah. Um, what else? Uh, I really love Passover too. Uh, but it's so much work. <laughs> I would, I've been doing my own Seder for like three years, I think. And I would really like for someone else to invite me to a Seder because there's a lot. Um, and what else? I don't like Christmas. I don't like, we do do Christmas. My husband, you know, was raised Christian and, um, and the kid, you know, I, I don't, they'll have such a complex if you don't let them do Christmas, but it's not my favorite. Um, I do also like really like Halloween, but now it's mostly about the kids. It's not really about me. I used to love like thinking of a clever Halloween costume and putting it together the months before October, but I haven't like thought of a new costume since my kid was born. What's your favorite kind of climate fiction cross genre type? 
Cli-Fi Detective, Cli-Fi Adventure, Cli-Fi YA. So I love, Cli-Fi is not a genre unto itself. Cli-Fi can be anything as long as like the themes and the setting are, um, you know, heavily influenced by the climate or the characters have been very influenced by climate. Like climate has, climate change and, or environmental destruction has to be like very central to the book. So that can happen in any genre. And I love when it shows up in unexpected places, any unexpected place. So the most, most climate fiction these days is like near future post-apocalyptic dystopia, where it's like, let's fast forward 50 years, 20 years, 100 years, think about what the climate's gonna look like and how that's gonna impact our lives. A lot of those authors imagine sort of a turn towards barbarism and a collapse, total collapse of like centralized governments. I don't foresee that happening at all. Um, but I've written a good bit in that genre uh, and I've read a good bit in that genre. So, and there are some great books that I love in that genre, the Parable of the Sower series, for example. But uh, I love when Clive Feist turns up in unexpected places. So one was like Wench, my friend Maxine Kaplan's book, is a YA fantasy that ends up having these uh, real climate themes, like the magic system creates pollution that is deeply destabilizing the world, and there's like an eco-fascism plot line. It's very cool. So I love whenever I get like surprised finding climate themes somewhere I didn't expect to see them. Um, what are your biggest influence, fiction influences that aren't sci-fi? So I have to say, when I was in college, I was very much into the modernists. Um, I did my senior thesis on Virginia Woolf, and I think she's still a big influence on my writing. Uh, especially the thing that I, I think that I've taken from her is just wanting to find like really, really closely observed, really small details of everyday life, which are kind of what make life and which are kind of the important things the little minutia can be so important and can tell you so much about a character and what their life is like and what they prioritize and care about so i think that's what i took from wolf i also and this is very uncool of me this is not trendy at all but i love ernest hemingway <laughs> and that's not you're not supposed to say that anymore i get that he was very problematic in a whole lot of ways um but I think, I also think A Fair Old Arms is like a perfect book and I love that book so much. And in fact, um, you know, it's a beautiful love story to me. I think people think Catherine is 2D. I think she's a really interesting character. I think it's a great anti-war story. It's about deserting the army, which there's really not many books about that. Um, and there's a scene where Catherine, um, and is it Frank or Henry? It's Frank. I can't even remember the protagonist's name. I taught this book. I taught this book to seniors and they loved it. High schoolers really dig this book. Um, they, anyways, he's deserting the army and he's fleeing across Lake Maggiore in Italy to get um, to Switzerland. And the, my husband and I went to that lake and sailed a sailboat on that lake for our honeymoon. Like This book was like hugely influential to both of us. He also read it at a time I encouraged him to read it at a time when he was still in the army and I was trying to get him to get out. Uh, and that was one of the books I think that, you know, kind of gave him the courage to do that or the motivation to do that. So, um, yeah, definitely Hemingway. I believe in using, you know, I believe in tight prose. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. Lately, some influences, uh, Richard Powers, just like the audacity of his novels. I think he's like really brave and I wanna have that like bravery of the white man to write like a 500 word book about trees. Like I admire that. Um, he's got a lot of audacity. Also authors who have like kind of radical sensibilities, Octavia Butler, River Solomon, and Key Jenemison. Like I know these author, you can tell from their writing that these authors are communists or anarchists or somewhere in the anarcho-communist spectrum, very radical, very far left. And that comes out in the fiction and the world building and the prose. And I lately gravitate more towards that kind of writing. Which authors do you look up to is a closely related question. Um, and I think, but it's a little different because it's like, who do you admire as an author? And to me, that's authors who are really engaged in activism with their communities. And these tend to be black and indigenous writers. Um, I've been reading a lot of Palestinian literature this year. A lot of Palestinian writers like um, 
Hala Alian and Susan Abalawa, like I always see them doing activism on their Instagram for Palestine, in addition to being authors who are writing about, um, you know, Palestinian um, issues and Palestinian characters. And I do believe that writing is activism or it, writing can be activism. I believe writing is always political. And I think to be, a, if you want to be a good activist type writer, you need to also be doing some kind of activism and organizing in your community to inform that work. Um, the writing and the activism can inform each other. So I, like I said, I see that in Palestinian writers. I see it in um, black writers, like obviously Angela Davis or Ruth Wilson Gilmore's who are writers and activists. Um, uh, Native American writers, you got Robin Kimmerer and Nick Estes, two I read in the last year. Those are all nonfiction authors. Um, I have to think a little harder to think of fiction authors off the top of my head who are doing that much kind of like activism and engaged in community. Um, but those are the types of authors I really admire and I aspire to be more like them. I always feel like I'm not doing enough uh, sort of organizing and activism and stuff like that. Um, Someone else asked, you said at one point your next book might have a romance. Is that still a storyline? Any romance wrecks? So yes, there's a big romance plotline in the Free People's Village, which is the whip I just completed. However, I wouldn't say it's a romance. Romance is a central theme. It's romance if like Circe or Song of Achilles are romance, like, you know, <laughs> but it's not a romance because it's not going to all tie up in a happy ending at the end. Um, but romance is very central to the story. Uh, I don't really have romance wrecks in adult because I realize I don't really read adult romance. So if I'm missing out, you know, like other than, like I said, like Circe and Song of Achilles are like the most romancy books I can remember reading in like the last five years. So if I'm missing out, drop me some titles that you recommend. I do read queer YA romance because that's like a hole in my life, right? Like <laughs> those were books that I needed as a kid that didn't exist. So I still read those. So some good ones I've read in like the last year or two, like Mermaid in the Sea, no, The Mermaid, The Witch in the Sea, Felix Ever After, You Should See Me in a Crown. Those were some really ones I really enjoyed. Um, oh, that's it. That's the last question. So Thank you everybody for watching. I hope this was kind of fun or interesting. Um, again, I'm just kind of here to like put my random ideas out in YouTube in kind of a casual way. And I'm also, I also do ASMR. I just released a new video of that yesterday. I'm not sure when this is gonna publish, but um, yeah. So I hope that you enjoyed this and I hope you'll continue, I hope you'll like it. I hope you'll continue subscribing and keep showing up and tell me what other kind of videos you like me to make because I'm kind of make all kinds of stuff and I'm not sure what to what what y'all appreciate the most so let me know and I'll see you next time